People don't want to pay carbon taxes, and to be honest, I don't want you to pay them either, because this type of tax is not meant to raise revenues for government. They're meant to discourage individuals and corporations from using fossil fuels. They're a perfect example of Pigouvian taxation. That's a tax meant to correct for market failures caused by externalities. In plainer language, you can think of it as a fine, if that makes more sense to you. Just like a parking fine, the goal is to get people to change behaviors. Go pay for a parking garage instead of blocking the street with your car. Go pay for a heat pump instead of polluting our air with a natural gas furnace. But there is an important difference. The solutions to climate change are far more expensive and more complicated than making alternative parking arrangements. You usually wind up having to replace capital equipment, which has a normal lifespan of years or even decades. Scrapping lots of cars and boilers and so on partway through their useful life would create lots of jobs, but it would be terribly expensive, especially if a sudden changeover creates a shortage of parts, labor, and capital. Giving years of advance notice doesn't solve this problem because it's to everyone's financial advantage to delay until the very last minute before spending to make changes, and because too many people simply ignore early warnings anyway. After all, we've been hearing about the dire consequences that climate change will have for 30 years now, and yet most of us have continued to increase carbon emissions throughout that time, secretly hoping, I guess, that the day of reckoning would never come. So if we want to avoid shocking the economy with prohibitions, it seems that we have to start the tax low so that some will choose to pay the carbon tax for a few years rather than throw away brand new equipment. But those taxes that are actually paid, they drain money out of the economy without actually helping the climate. It's not much, maybe 1% of consumption, but still, a Pigouvian tax works best when people don't pay it. So economists have come up with a few tools to help reduce the drag that a carbon tax has on the economy. Some of these are rate escalation, targeted tax breaks, and revenue recycling. Rate escalation is such a simple idea that economists generally don't bother explaining it. And yet it is commonly misunderstood by voters. There's a common myth out there that this is some kind of sales trick, that the idea is that to start the tax at a low enough level to avoid a revolt and then surprise people with higher prices later on. But that's just silly. There's no contract lock-in in a democracy. We all want transparency in government, and we only want good policies to survive. The real reason why an escalating carbon tax is good policy is because it encourages the free market to crowdsource a priority list that minimizes economic costs. Let's see how that works. When faced with a rising carbon tax, the first people to get rid of their fossil fuels will be the low-hanging fruit, those who can easily afford to make their transition, and those who had old, inefficient equipment that was due for replacement anyway. Essentially, these are the people who can make changes at the lowest cost, in terms of dollars per ton of greenhouse gas abated. As the carbon tax rises, you'll be able to choose your price point where, for example, it makes more sense to re-insulate your house rather than keep paying the tax. That price point might be different for your car than for your home than for your store, and it's going to depend on how close your equipment is to its end of life. This allows society to spread out the work over time, creating jobs without overwhelming supply chains. Those who don't emit that much carbon, but for whom making the switch will be particularly expensive, will be the last to make capital expenses. Doing things in this order minimizes society's overall cost of capital. It minimizes the interest that we collectively have to pay before we get to a carbon-free society. And if you think that capital resources are limited, then it maximizes the speed at which we can decarbonize. So the ramp up of the carbon tax is not a secret meant to trick anyone. It's just meant to reduce economic shocks and it works better when people clearly see what's coming.
25 countries have implemented a carbon tax as of 2020, including Canada. Canada's tax is currently at $30 per tonne of carbon dioxide emitted, and it's going to rise to $170 per tonne by 2030. I made a spreadsheet to show what that works out to for natural gas, propane, and gasoline, and to show an example of how it might impact a purchase decision. The link is in the comments. I want my fellow Canadians to know about our carbon tax so that they can start making plans to avoid paying it. Canada's carbon taxes do not apply to everyone. The federal tax only applies to half of the provinces and territories, while the other half is covered by provincial carbon pricing policies that supersede the federal tax. The federal carbon tax only applies to carbon dioxide emissions, so it doesn't apply to emissions from cattle, soil, or cement. And it doesn't apply to emission-intensive, trade-exposed industries. These are companies that cannot kick the fuel habit no matter how high the tax goes. Take, for example, steel and paper companies that have to compete against imports from places that don't have a carbon price yet. The cost of reducing their carbon emissions might just price their products out of the market, while we start buying foreign goods from other countries with a larger carbon footprint. Imposing a carbon tax on these industries might make global emissions worse, while triggering layoffs in this country. That's why it may be a good idea to exempt some industries until carbon pricing becomes global. But this is really a band-aid. I would rather see border adjustments for carbon content of import and exports to level the international playing field. The European Union may start applying border adjustments this year to protect their green jobs. One of the problems with just giving out tax breaks is that it's hard to decide where to stop. What about low-income households who just can't find a, a low-carbon apartment because they don't exist yet? But trying to closely tailor who pays and who doesn't pay the tax puts more responsibility on the, in the government's hands to make wise choices about how we lead our lives. And that's risky and expensive to administer. When in doubt, it's best to apply a carbon tax broadly and accept that some people will just have to pay the tax until it makes sense for them individually to upgrade to newer technology. Those taxes don't do any good in government coffers, so it's important to re-inject them into the economy quickly, for example, by distributing checks to everyone. That's what Canada's Climate Action Incentive does. It's line 138 on your federal income tax form. A family of four in Ontario will get $600 in 2021 or $1,000 in Saskatchewan. Those amounts do not depend on how much carbon you emit as an individual only on, on how much carbon your province emits. This essentially sets up a competition within each province. If you reduce your emissions more than your neighbors do, then you'll pay less tax, but you'll get the same refund as they do. The, the amount of that refund is going to go up at first as the carbon tax rate rises and collects more revenues, but it will fall eventually as provinces cut their emissions. There are other ways that carbon tax revenues could be recycled, and a flat universal distribution like this might not be the best way to do it. Some economists argue that revenues should actually go to carbon mitigation projects. That way, if the carbon tax fails to change private behaviors, it will raise extra revenues for the government's own mitigation projects. That gives you a mechanism that can automatically compensate for changing economic conditions from year to year, and that's a useful feature. But the important thing is that the money isn't wasted and goes back into the economy somehow, even if it's not in the most efficient way. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and Canada's Ecofiscal Commission all agree that carbon taxes are a very effective way to achieve deep decarbonization. So there's no hypocrisy in avoiding the carbon tax yourself while supporting it as a policy. Thank you for watching.